romance readers. I am Liz Donatelli. Welcome to Reader Seeks Romance, the number one romance novel talk show on YouTube. Today's guest is New York Times bestselling romance author and Romance Landia fan favorite, Sarah McLean. Sarah chatted about her new Victorian romance adventure novel, Bombshell. And she shared the real life London girl gang who inspired her Hell's Bells series. Sarah also shared which romance authors she would recruit to join her very own girl gang. And she played Quickie's Q&A. Enjoy, and be sure to like, comment, you could win a prize, watch to see how, and subscribe. Hi, Sarah, welcome to Rita Seeks Romance. Hi, thanks for having me, Liz. Happy book birthday to you. Congrats on the launch of your Hell's Bells historical romance series and the release of book one, Bombshell. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Do you still get nervous when a book releases and you share that part of yourself, you know, with the world? Of course. I don't know anybody. I don't know how anybody could just feel like it's a normal day. This is book, I think this is 15 for me. It's the 15th of where it's just me releasing something alone. And it feels like by now I should be used to it. And I should be used to the sort of, you know, waking up early, you know, having butterflies, feeling like there's something that I should be doing. And the sort of sad secret of it all is that there's actually nothing to do today except, you know, talk to you and, um, you know, be on social media, but there's, it, you know, nothing changes. It's not different today than it was yesterday, but boy, it feels that way. Um, and yeah, I still get nervous. And especially when you launch a new series, especially when you launch a series that I've been thinking about, that you've been thinking about for as long as I've been thinking about Hell's Bells, you get nervous, you feel like, oh, are people going to love it? Are they going to feel the way I want them to feel when they read it? Um, so yeah, it's always a little bit nerve wracking, but also very exciting because as I like to say, the books actually don't belong to me anymore. They belong to you now. So the what I think the book is and what you get are very different, I think, often. Hell's Bells is really focused around a group of extremely powerful women who maybe do not hold the kind of power that you would think. Um, they are working together kind of under underground and under the view, beyond, outside of the view of society to basically stick it to men who are terrible. Um, so that means, and that is a range, there are a range of ways that they do this. There's, you know, a rival gang that's, you know, by, that's run by men and, you know, populated by men. That there are powerful men who are doing terrible things in society. There are powerful men who are doing terrible things, you know, at the very top of society. And then there are just generally people who are being terrible to um, people who are weaker than them. And my girls, the Hell's Bells, um, won't stand for it anymore. Right. And they're tired of waiting for someone else to step up. So they've yeah. stepped up. There's also a romance. <laughs> yeah, there's that too. Yeah, yeah. That's what's so great is that there's so much of both. The, uh, the sort of running idea when I was working on the series and pitching it to my agent and to my editor was, um, it's the Avengers, but make it plain like make it sexy and historical. Um, so each one of these women will get a love story. The heroine of this book is Cecily Talbot, who fans of my Scandal and Scoundrel series will remember. She is the fifth unmarried sister of that series, um, brought forward here to this series. Um, and it is a second chance love story between Cecily, who is 30 years old, rich, powerful, and has had wants nothing to do with like any of the social constructs that she has kind of been thrust into as the daughter of an earl and um, an American, Caleb, who um, owns a tavern and a series of taverns in America, but one tavern here in London. And um, they have had eyes for each other for years and it is finally time for them to 
have more than eyes for each other. <laughs> so the banter between Cecily and Caleb is um, so just perfect, clever and charming and flirtatious, and it's so fluid. Um, and also the conversations between Cecily and you know the other Hell's Bells is so captivating and quick. Um, so I envision you play acting the parts as you're <laughs> writing to hear the cadence and to see if you hit certain beats. Am I way off? Like, is that the process of your creative? Oh. I mean, I don't want to say yes, but kind of. I mean, I don't, I don't, um, I don't do that. I don't play act. Um, I, but when dialogue comes really easily to me um, when I'm writing, the dialogue pieces are the pieces that really flow. Um, and that's always been true. And um, so for me, my books are really rich with dialogue. I always have to go back and revision and add in, you know, what is all the other stuff <laughs> because I mean, I'm notorious for having notes from my editor in the margin that say like, this reads like a play <laughs> because it's just like one right after another. Yeah. And then I have to go back in and like pack in, what does the room look like? What's happening? How is the scene playing out? Because if I leave it to my own devices, it will just be two people in a room talking. Right. You take the time with the staging and describing the movement of the characters and there's an awareness of the setting and it feels very theatrical to me. Um, well, so I was going to ask, do you have a background in theater? I actually do have a background in theater, but um, I mean, it's not a massive background when I was in college. I I worked summers at the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center, actually, which is a pretty famous summer stock theater, yes, um, which awesome. was an extraordinary experience. Um, and, you know, so I think when you grow up or you have some kind of theatrical connection, yes, that is always imbued into your books. But this book, particularly Bombshell, you know, each of my series is really designed to have a feeling for the reader. And, um, you know, my last series, The Bare Knuckle Bastards, was supposed to feel a little bit like a fairy tale for when you were reading the, the books. This series, I hope, is to sort of lean into romantic adventure. I want it to feel like you're watching a kind of big budget movie, but it also has that intense romance piece too. Um, so, you know, there are bar brawls and explosions and like scenes, you know, on the docks and, you know, you know on, the, on the piers. And I think all of these, these scenes, the work for me in writing Bombshell and now the next book in the series is um, where I'm blocking, I am blocking out fight scenes in a way that, I mean, I've always loved a fight scene, but these are different kinds of scenes. This book, pretty early in the book, there's a bar brawl that was really fun to stage, you know, and I've never done a scene like that before. Well, your execution is brilliant because I have, I had the thought several times is I feel like I'm watching a movie. Oh, yeah. But better than a movie, um, you know, uh, <laughs> but because it, they're going to kiss. Because they're gonna kiss, yeah. The real life Victorian era girl gang, Forty Elephants, inspired the Hell's Bell series. So yes. tell me about that. I knew I wanted to write a girl gang. Um, after I finished the Bare Knuckle Bastards, which was my last series, I sort of knew that I wasn't going to go back to Mayfair, right? I wasn't going to go back to ballrooms. I really, um, I really like the darker corners. And so I'm going to stay there for a little while. And so I knew I wanted to write a girl gang. So I started doing research on criminal syndicates, like crime syndicates in England. Um, and there's a guy, a, a really talented historian named Brian McDonald, who's done a ton of work around um, gangs in London and England. And um, through him, I learned about the 40 Elephants, which is the largest female girl gang we think possibly in the world. Um, and it was active in London uh, in the late 1800s and throughout the 1900s until about 1960, um, which, which is when the final, the last queen of the 40 elephants died. Um, and I got really interested and excited about this girl gang and started reading kind of as much as I could about them. Now, the 40 elephants are true criminals. I mean, they ran, uh, they were bookmakers, they were known, it was the largest shoplifting ring in the United Kingdom ever. <laughs> and, um, and they did these cool things, like they 
um, because of the way skirts were um, designed in the late in the late nineteenth century. Um, they built these sort of intense, huge pockets and and steel cages inside their skirts to hold. I mean, they could fit men's suits, fur hats, fur stoles, um, leather goods, whole bolts of silk. I mean, like they could really pack pack their skirts full of stuff and then take off out of a department store. Um, and and they really sort of terrorized London for a while. And I got really excited by this idea knowing that I was not going to write, you know, a true crime syndicate. Um, but in the books, I use some of the, the cons and the skills that I have learned about from the 40 Elephants. Well, I mean, I have to have my ride or dies, right? So you have Sophie Jordan right there on the shelf behind you. Sophie is my best friend and basically the reason I'm still a romance novelist. She helps me brainstorm all of my books. I need somebody who can write like an epic saga, so I need uh, Kennedy Ryan to join me. Um, I need somebody who can write a badass like feminist text, so I'm going to bring Adriana Herrera in to do that with me. Um, and I need somebody who can write really funny, so Christina Lauren. And then I think that's four. So Christina Lauren, that's two, two and one. That's two, so I'm cheating, so I get five. <laughs> okay, then five. And what would, what would be your mission? What would be uh, your your goal as a as a girl gang? The mission would be to bring like super fun, super feminist books okay. to as many people who want to read them. So awesome. Jude Devereaux is the Black Lion, and it changed my life. I mean, my sister, who is 10 years older than me, was, a, was also a romance reader, and she went to college and left her collection of romances under the bed um, in our room. And when I was, you know, 10 or 11, I pulled the Black Lion out from, you know, a box under her bed, and um, I read it, and it was a medieval and it is, it was written in the 19, in 1981. And uh, it reads like that now, although, I mean, I still read it once a year, but like, I don't recommend this as it has all of the problems of the books from the 1980, early 1980s, but it has at its core, that kind of the bones of the genre are there, which is, you know, there's this like, it's so romantic and the dark moment at the end is so dark and you really feel like, oh, these, these two are never going to end up together. And then, you know, it has a hero who just like breaks and has to, you know, rebuild himself, you know, to be worthy of a heroine. And it just has all the pieces that you can sort of see in my book. But the story goes that when I was signing with Avon Books, um, well, I had written Nine Rules to Break and my agent had sent it out and my editor at Avon called me uh, called my agent and said, will Sarah come in and meet with us? Like, she's in New York. We'd like to meet with her. So I went in and uh, and they sat me down in a room underneath a poster. Like, there was a, an, a huge blow-up cover of Jude Devereaux's The Black Lion, like, on the wall. And I sat down and I was like, oh, my God, like, it's a sign. I have to be here. Like, Avon is, you know, it's it. This This is the place. And that's where I've been since the beginning. So... Wow. I really do. I mean, like, she is 100% the reason why I write romance novels. What three items are always on hand when you write? I use black wing pencils, um, which are always on hand. I always have a notebook with me. I mean, I to the point where, like, I do not leave the house without a notebook. I have a planner that has um, where I track, you know, my day and my word count and I have to keep myself honest. Like if I start writing, I have to write 500 words. So like I track my, I track my words in 100 word increments on like a big sheet of graph paper. Um, so you can see that that's how it gets written. Each one of these little squares is 100 words. Are you, are you a Virgo? Is, is your horoscope Virgo? No, I'm not a Virgo. In fact, 
I'm a Sagittarius, which is the opposite of a Virgo, as you know. Mm-hmm. And um, the reason why I do this is because I literally cannot focus. Like, so I need to have a reward. I mean, a hundred, a hundred words is like two sentences. Like I need a reward every two sentences to keep going. I should not have this job, Liz. <laughs> So it's actually not for organization purposes. In fact, my one of my dearest friends is Kate Claiborne, who wrote Love at First, which is also on your shelf. And Kate is a Virgo. And Kate, when she sees this, is like, why are there so many colors? <laughs> which is more difficult for you to write? The opening line of a novel or the very last line? The last line. Because it's always like, oh, I don't want it to be cheesy. You know, I, I, know what you mean. I, I, yeah. And often it, I mean, look, of course it's going to be cheesy, but it has to be different cheesy than all the other last lines that I've written. And it's too hard. So I don't like it. If you woke up one morning to find that you had been transported to an elegant London house in Victorian England, what's the first thing you would do? I would go like immediately. I would leave the house. I would like, I'd want to see everything. Um, so I probably, if I was in an elegant London house, I would probably take myself to like the worst part of town and get myself like murdered. That's probably how that would go. It would happen within <laughs> one hour. <laughs> okay, then maybe you shouldn't grow up in Victorian England. <laughs> it's true, but I would definitely find myself very quickly in a difficult situation. <laughs> That's interesting. Which time and place have you not written about but would like to? I would really like to write a medieval. I've said this sort of like publicly, and I just actually wrote, I haven't technically written a medieval. I wrote, I just wrote a short story for an anthology that was a, a group of authors doing a retelling of Arthurian myth. Um, So it sort of has a medieval feel. It's about a lady blacksmith, but it's not a medieval. Um, And I, but I would really like to write like a true Scottish medieval where like there's a border war and like he has to wrap her in his plaid to keep her warm at night. But I don't know how I will ever get myself to that. Last question. What romance novel are you currently reading? I just finished a YA novel. Um, a YA romance named Grave Mercy by Robin Lefevers. It's an assassin romance set in the 1400s. It's great. Just before Grave Mercy, I read Devil in Disguise, which is the new Lisa Kleypas book, which is great. Yeah. It's delicious. Okay. Yeah. So, Sarah, thank you so much for taking time to join me here on Reader Seeks Romance. Thank you so much for having me, Liz. It was really, really fun. Mm-hmm.